end. Um, so my colleague Bellin will start the recording now and you should see um, a pop-up message on your screen. Um, great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Jeremy Doty, and I'm USAC's resident director for our four program locations in England, Brighton, Bristol, London, and Reading. And tonight I'm joining you from London. Um, first, I want to welcome you to the session, which focuses on practical tips for graduate school. Uh, throughout the semester, USAC has published a variety of career development workshops and cultural workshops. We've also hosted three other panel discussions like we are today. So this is our fourth and final panel discussion for the fall 2020 semester. And this session is really intended for folks uh, at different points in the graduate school spectrum. So some of you may just be considering graduate school and others may definitely be attending. And perhaps you're somewhere in between. So today we'll hear from both higher education professionals and graduate, stu gra graduate students to learn more about their experiences in a grad program. So just a little bit more about myself and then we'll introduce some of the other folks who are serving as our panelists. Like I said before, I'm calling in from London and as for my graduate school journey, I attended a master's degree program in international education at the School for International Training in Brattleboro, Vermont. And after that experience, I worked for a few years before jumping into a PhD program in higher education administration at Bowling Green State University. Um, my co-panelist today and co-presenter is Kara Bingham, who serves as USAC's Director of Academic Affairs. So Kara, could you please introduce yourself? Kara, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. I'll start over. Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to have all of you joining us today. Um, as Jeremy said, my name is Kara Bingham, and I'm USAC's Director of Academic Affairs. Um, I My own uh, graduate school experience began many years ago. Um, I was a French, my undergraduate degree was in French. And you know, at the time, I was you know, really curious to know what you know what I wanted to do with all of this. And I happened to have um, a peer advisor job in a study abroad office, which introduced me to this world of international education. And I thought, wow, this is absolutely fantastic. And for me, you know, these little steps are what led me then to getting my master's degree in intercultural relations from Lesley University um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so my career really has been focused entirely on international education, both sides from um, international student advising, international credential evaluation, leading me to now to my position as Director of Academic Affairs for USAC. So um, this, this topic really excites me. I know a lot of you have questions about you know, what types of graduate programs you want to do. And so the angle that I'm going to take today is providing you with a little more information about pursuing graduate programs abroad I think when you often think about um, getting grad school, you're focused entirely on the US. So I want to add a little bit more of the international dimension to things. So I will turn this over then to our other panelists. Um, yes. Maureen? Okay. Yes, Maureen, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I am Maureen Wilson. Uh, I was Jeremy's dissertation advisor once upon a mm -hmm. time. Uh, I've been at Bowling Green State University for the last 20 years, uh, started as an assistant professor and moved uh, on to full professor. I was department chair for eight years, and then for the last two years, I've served in our College of Education and Human Development as an associate dean focusing on faculty affairs, graduate uh, education, and student affairs. So happy to be here today. Great, thanks for joining us, Maureen. Uh, we also have two USAC staff members who will be joining us on the panel. Uh, first, um, Caitlin Armbruster, can you introduce yourself? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Caitlin Armbruster. I work at USAC as a University Relations Coordinator. 
um, where I've been for the last few years. Um, a little bit about my education journey. I started off at community college and actually even before that, um, I spent a gap year abroad as an exchange student, um, which really helped inform a lot of what came next. But um, I, I attended community college. I transferred to a four year institution, um, Lehigh University, where I studied um, environmental and global studies. And currently I'm enrolled at Northern Arizona University um, in the Masters of Educational Leadership Program for Community College and Higher Education. Um, and I'm, I actually just applied for their EDD program at NAU at Northern Arizona University. So this comes at a really good time because I'm in the process of applying to grad school while being in grad school. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Great, thanks Caitlin. I'm sure everybody will be excited to hear about your experiences. Um, and then our final panelist is Nadine Black. Nadine, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Jenny said, my name is Nadine. I am from Reno, Nevada, currently based in Reno. I am a program advisor uh, for USAC study abroad in Oceania, South America, and Africa. Um, I graduated from the University of Nevada with dual degrees in French and journalism. I was also a peer advisor for USAC um, in my undergrad after I came back from my study abroad and I learned early on international education is what I wanted to do. I wasn't quite ready for graduate school um, when I left UNR, so I traveled for a couple years, taught English all over, and um, I realized that if I wanted to um, you know, make good money, have any type of leadership position, I would need to get my master's. So I came back to the States uh, last year, started working for USAC, and I started my graduate program at SIT, um, sorry, School for International Education, like Jeremy. And so hopefully I'll be graduating next year. Great, welcome Nadine. And I'm personally really excited to hear more about your experiences at the School for International Training. All right, so we've got a great group of panelists. Um, this is how it's going to work. We have a few questions that we've received and that we've prepared. Um, but as the participants, I really encourage you to make the most of today's session. So if you do have questions, feel free to post those questions in the chat and we'll make sure that they get answered. Otherwise, in Teams, you also see the hand icon. So you can click the hand icon, which is similar to raising your hand. And if we see that your hand is raised, then we'll be sure to call on you and you can ask the panelists your question. So we really want you to maximize your experience today. Um, so don't be shy to get those questions asked and then hopefully answered. So for our panelists, our first question is really for folks who are um, perhaps at an early phase in their graduate school journey. So what tips would you offer to individuals who are just starting to research graduate programs? How do they find a graduate program that's maybe a good fit for them? Um, and Maureen, maybe we'll get started with you. Well, I think one strategy, uh, if you're reasonably sure that you know which area you'd like to study in, uh, if you can find some people doing jobs that you might be interested in doing, then I think talking to them about their journeys, what path they took to get to where they're going, um, to me that's a pretty good way to start and, and get some ideas. There are, of course, tons of web resources and, and such to look at different programs. I think that as a starting point might be a little overwhelming um, versus trying to narrow down some areas that you think you're interested in um, and to get a sense of the different types of programs. So depending on the field, some programs might have more of a, a scholarship focus in that they're preparing people to be academics and faculty members. Some have more of an administrative focus where they're really preparing people to for practitioner type positions. Um, some are a blend of, of both. Um, so our doctoral program in higher education administration, for instance, 
probably sends more people into administrative roles, but we've also sent uh, some hearty number of people into faculty positions. Um, but there again, somebody would want to have a sense of what their end goal was. If somebody wanted to be a researcher at a Big Ten type university, you would probably go someplace else than here. If you wanted to teach at a more of a regional state program with a greater emphasis on master's preparation and that sort of thing, this would this could be a great a great place. So I think trying to build a network and build some of those connections can be a good place to start asking a lot of questions. And Kara, what would that look like for folks who maybe are interested in doing a graduate program abroad? Sure. I mean, I think one thing that, you know, if for people who are um, currently enrolled at universities, don't forget your career services office. I think that people forget that the career office also can provide really great guidance in researching graduate programs, graduate schools help you um, with interest surveys. If you know, you're not really, you know you want to go on um, for another degree, but maybe aren't sure which field is the best match for you. Um, career service offices have great um, interest inventories and they can help guide you with some of those greater life decisions. Your academic advisor is also a very good resource just for ideas in academic fields and how they perhaps tie two careers that you have interest in in the future. So before we get into the international, I wanted to mention those two points. But I think when you're looking at um, exploring the idea of studying abroad, um, I'm posting in the comments here um, a link. It's going through right now, it looks like, um, resources for graduate schools abroad. Most countries have um, their Ministry of Education will have a website that's designed specifically to promote higher education in that country. So for example, in the UK, the British Council has a site, Study in the UK, that talks about UK higher education. It talks about the different universities that are there, provides links to different programs. It's a little bit different from what you went through when you research study abroad um, in that you're really doing this very much um, independently. And so you have I would advise you to to recognize also that language will be different. The way they use the word courses, faculty, um, papers, subjects, they can mean different things. So um, just be aware of that as you're going through the process. Um, but they, the schools abroad also have international offices, have um, international advisors. So you can connect with people on the campuses abroad who are there really to support international students students and applicants from the US and elsewhere. That's really insightful, Kara. Thank you. Um, so let's see what this actually looked like in terms of the student experience. So Caitlin, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how you found uh, your graduate program? Yes, um, and I think these are also tips um, in, in uh, what I've experienced. Um, definitely, when searching for a graduate program, I had a lot of struggles. Um, it took me a pretty long time, about three years to figure out what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, but I wasn't sure. So uh, my, my first tip is to take your time. Um, and I think taking your time, you know, helps you develop an understanding of what you truly want to do. Um, and I think sort of a second tier to that is, is go to work get a job. Um, it might not seem intuitive to, if you're looking for a grad program, go to work. But I feel like when you you do go to work and you start looking at, you know, what that work environment is, whatever you get into, you can, you, you know, make some decisions for yourself, whether you want to continue there or, uh, you know, explore something else. Uh, because, I mean, ultimately, this is a huge investment in, of your time, of your money. And, um, having that time and and really I think this is the second and maybe like last tip is don't compare yourself to others um, because it's I mean I was doing that I got stuck in that mindset for probably a little bit too long looking at maybe friends or or colleagues and, and what their path was and what they did and um, it, it it's hard to compare yourself um, and I don't think that serves you well um, but one okay one final tip and one thing that i did while i was um, looking for a graduate program was um and i picked this up from a conference um, a while ago but um 
look at people in the field that you aspire to be um, and scour their LinkedIn, you know, Google, Google them, um, look at what their path was, um, send them a message if you can, ask them, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in your, your path, like what, what did you do, what, um, you know, what inspired you, like how, how, why did it look like this? Um, because I think that can, you know, help you understand that there's many different paths and it's not always a straight line like, oh, I want this job, so I'm, I'm gonna take this um, degree and then I'm gonna get there. Um, it's not like that. It's very zigzaggy and you're running in circles sometimes. So um, yeah, I think use the internet. I mean, Google's great. And I think I used Google more than anything else for my grad search. So that's my tip. Great, Caitlin. I really like that last tip about mm -hmm. finding figures in your field who inspire you. I think that's that's an incredibly helpful tip for students. Um, Nadine, what about you? What what sort of practical tips have you got as you searched for your program at the School for International Training? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, for me, it started off with just knowing what's out there, what is available. There are one-year programs, there are two-year programs, there are full-time, where all you do is do school. There are part-time programs. There are hybrid programs where each semester you can do um, in a different country. SIT offers one like that for environmental studies. So, you know, just knowing what you want to commit to was the first step. So for me, it was important that I was in a part-time program so I could work and do school and that those linked, that they mapped, that they went well together. Um, another thing that was important for me was what scholarships, what financial aid could the school offer me? And the biggest thing was what um, international opportunities were there. Would I, I knew I wanted to be in the United States and get my degree from um, an American university, but I wanted to be able to go abroad for a summer or to do a couple week courses in Chile, for example. So um, I would say figure out what you want first and then go, you know, like Google, do the research, talk to people. Um, and then once you kind of know what questions you ask, what, what questions to ask those people, you, I think your, your path will be a little bit more clear of where you should be applying to. Yeah, Nadine, I totally agree with you on those tips. I remember when I started searching for my PhD program, I had researched about 25 different universities, but my starting point was deciding which variables were most important to me. So I made this huge Excel document. I researched the institutions quite thoroughly over a three month period and Bowling Green ended up um, number one on that list because there were certain variables that were most important to me. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about assistantships in a moment, but Bowling Green offered guaranteed assistantships. They had a global understanding requirement, which was very appealing to me. Um, so we'll be sure to chat more about what some of those the themes mean in a moment. Um, one, one topic that I heard come up in the conversation regarded finances. So just to make sure that our participants have a good understanding, let's, let's perhaps draw some attention to some of those dynamics. So Let's talk about um, finances associated with graduate school. What about um, that concern that some individuals might have about going in debt or going further in debt? Could we maybe talk about scholarships and could we maybe talk about what an assistantship means? So Maureen, um, why don't you, you um, get us started? Uh, I could talk for a long time about, <laughs> about this one. Um, so uh, graduate assistantship is effectively part-time work, hopefully something closely related to what it is you're studying and, and preparing to do. So it could be a research assistant for a faculty member, but it could also be working in various offices on your, on your campus doing any number of, of things. So those come with a stipend or a salary um, and there are tools online that sometimes disclose that where you can see what's covered. Some schools cover health insurance, some don't. The pay rates can vary a good bit and almost certainly they would vary from masters to doctoral programs. Um, 
And then the scholarships, or sometimes you see them called tuition waivers, um, can come in tandem often with those assistantships. That funding very often is just for full-time students. Um, so sort of in exchange for your work, for your labor, they're, they're helping support you financially through the program. That's not to say that there's none of that available for part-time, but I uh, suspect that more part-time students are getting more of that funding either through some external scholarships, maybe support from their workplace, but likely uh, they're, they're taking on loans as well. One thing I want to highlight though, um, is that you might get advice from people that you shouldn't have to pay for graduate school. And I think that that advice is becoming more and more outdated in that, um, in, in years past, and now many years past, um, what we call in Ohio the state share of instruction, that's how much money we get from the state, um, whether it's based on graduation or courses completed, there's, there are, are different formulas. Uh, back in the day, that state share of instruction was upwards of 70%, and now it's probably less than 20%, or hovering around 20%. So we used to be able to effectively give away tuition, but still make money because of the money we got from the state. Well, the funding model in Ohio has shifted and it's shifted all over the country. So that model of being able to pay full freight for a whole lot of graduate students has really melted away. So you may well not come away with a full tuition waiver or full scholarship uh, support. My colleagues around the country are all struggling with this, with this same dynamic because people are still advising students you shouldn't have to pay for anything. And more and more, uh, you're going to have to pay for something. And even if you do have a package, you really want to look carefully at what's covered and what's not covered. You know, so I mentioned um, some cover health insurance, some don't. You know, so you really want to get in the weeds on that and to really understand what it is you're committing to and what that total cost uh, would be. You know, books and computers and all those things can add a good bit onto the, onto the cost as well. And then depending on where your program is, the cost of living, um, you know, you can still get an apartment in Bowling Green for $400 or so a month. That's not the case in Boston and New York and a whole lot of other cities, right? You know, so you need to, you need to have a good sense of that. And then depending on how far that would place you from other places you want to go, um, you know, are you going to have to fly home? uh with an expensive plane ticket anytime you want to see family at the holidays for instance so really trying to get a good sense of of what you'll have to invest and i think uh you know for those who've talked about working or, or working in between programs you know if you are uh, set yourself up well you can come into that with some savings that can mitigate the degree to which you need to take on significant debt during a during a grad program. Yeah, those are great tips. I know one one uh, component to my decision making process that really helped me was chatting with other students in the graduate program before I committed, just to get um, a real authentic picture of um, what those expenses would look like. Um, Kara, what would you add? Sure, I would just add um, that pursuing a graduate degree abroad isn't necessarily more expensive. Um, many of the degree programs overseas are shorter in length, um, especially your master's programs can be one year versus rather than two years, and the tuition fees are, are less than what you would find in the U.S. However, that can be offset by higher living expenses if you're in a major city, so you want to look at those things carefully. Many um, more, many of the, the larger name universities around the world have um, received permission to receive um, 
uh, what do you call it, uh, the federal scholarships and loans from the United States. And so I think when you're looking at the institutions, find out if they have gone through the paperwork to be able to receive um, federal loans from the United States, because that will open up some opportunities for students as well. Um, so that's, I mean, those are things that you want to be looking at. It's, it's not necessarily more expensive, um, which I think is often um, an assumption that students have. And then something just from my own experience that I would throw out there, when I was in graduate school, I actually um, took a full-time job at the university that I was you know, getting my degree from. And so I worked full-time and my university offered tuition benefits. It did mean that it took a little bit longer for me to get my master's degree, but at the same time, using the tuition benefits, I didn't have to pay for tuition and I was just um, dealing with the added costs of books and living expenses. So that's another pathway that you can consider as well. Yeah, those are great additional tips. Thanks, Kara. Um, Let me, sure. uh, I want to oh, yeah. pop in there too, in looking at what's covered. Uh, it's also possible tuition is covered, but not fees. And mm -hmm. fees can add a good yes. bit onto the total as well. So, so you just want to be real clear on what the total expense is and what support, if any, that you would be receiving. Uh, yeah. I know uh, BGSU has a graduate fee calculator available so you plug in some details and then it'll it'll show you the the full cost and that may well be available at, at other schools as well yeah great tip um, i'm sure the participants would be curious to hear some candid reflections from our two graduate students so nadine can you speak a little bit more about the role that finance has played in your decision making process yeah so um, for the students who have not yet decided um, if they're going to go to graduate school or they know um, but maybe want to take a year or two, I would recommend um, start networking with the right organizations. So there's the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps. I'm affiliated with an organization called Atlas Corps, um, all of whom provide funding um, and if not like full scholarships, small financial contributions, which are still meaningful. And so I was able to get a small scholarship through Atlas Core, which is really what helped me, um, you know, decide which school I was gonna go to. So um, I would say get involved with an organization ahead of time that you know is going to contribute to your education in some way. Um, and so for me, I also had to take out a loan because, um, you know, SIT is a really good school. It, it's in my field. I know that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Their network is amazing. And so I was able to get a small scholarship and take out a loan. And I do feel the weight of that, you know, that loan that I'm going to have to pay back. But I feel okay knowing I'm with a really good university. I have a global network. I will always have a job. Um, so I think if you can set yourself up ahead of time, some of the, the burdens of having to take out a loan kind of go away and the stress of having to take out a loan goes away. Yeah, Nadine, I'm really glad you mentioned the Peace Corps. So I served in the Peace Corps in Ukraine from 2005 to 2007. And one of the huge benefits uh, for returned Peace Corps volunteers is the Paul D. Coverdell Fellows Program. So that's a program um, that's at institutions across the United States, and it varies by school and by particular program, but there are different levels of funding available for return Peace Corps volunteers. Um, Caitlin, what about you? What, what role did finances play in your decision-making process? Um, so those, that's a great question because those were the decision making process for me. Um, I am a student that has completely relied on scholarships and grant funding my entire education. Um, I am, am very fortunate to not have any student debt because I have been a, a Jack Kent Cook scholar. And um, even though they do offer scholarships for graduate students, um, it's it's for students that have already received one of their earlier younger um, scholarships. So um, 
if you have, and I just want to make a plug here, it's a really great scholarship for the Jack Kent Cook um, Foundation. If you do have um, younger siblings or friends that are in high school or in community college, um, definitely uh, reach out to them with this scholarship because it paid my entire um, bachelor's degree, it's paying my master's degree, and it's paying for at least two years of my, if I am um, accepted into my EDD program. So um, with that, I, I think there are something, there's something really important to make a note of here is that the big difference for me, if you're applying for FAFSA or have applied for FAFSA or have received the Pell Grant like I have, um, the Pell Grant is not something you can get as a graduate student. That's, um, it was a big surprise to me. I, I just figured that there might be some grant funding coming in um, because I had always experienced that. However, that's that's a big difference. When you're applying for the FAFSA for graduate school, that's not something that you should expect to see. You'll see um, opportunities to take out loans, of course, um, but, uh, and, and, and I should mention, this will, again, differ from whatever university you're going to and what funding they would have. And sometimes that is determined by um, department or you know specific programs even um, what funding is available through from for grants but um uh yeah so i i have been really fortunate in that sense um but i think it, you know even with having that scholarship i always had a backup plan in place because i knew for some reason my scholarship wasn't going to come through I needed to make sure that the program I was in was one that I wanted to be in, the one that I needed to be in, and something I had, and, and that I had a plan to pay that off if for whatever reason I had to, you know, take on that debt myself. So uh, I think that, you know, it, I don't have much to add um, other than, you know, make sure whatever your program, whatever program you're going for is one that you can afford that is good for you and that you want to be in. Um, so that it, it's an investment that you truly, you know, can stand by. Great. Thanks for sharing that that story, Caitlin. I think that's a powerful testimonial. And if you have any information about the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, um, could you just post that in the chat so folks could uh, access that information at their free time? Um, brilliant. So let's say we, we do have uh, individuals who are definitely interested in applying to graduate school. What sort of tips might we have for those individuals during the application process? Do you have any things that they should definitely do? Or are there any tips that you have for things that they should definitely avoid? Um, Kara, we'll get started with you this time. Sure. I think I'm just going back to what I said earlier in with regard to talking to the career services office um, and the individuals on your campus who do graduate school advising will be really important because every school is going to be different. Um, but I think, you know, with looking at overseas programs, as you're looking at the application process, it may, it's going to be very different from what you experience in the U.S., um, you know, the, the GMAT, GRE, is not likely to be required, but if you're going, they may be looking at a greater connection to your undergraduate degree to your master's degree. I think in the U.S., you know, we, we, we jump around a little bit, whereas I think overseas, there's much more con um, continuity between undergraduate studies and going on to graduate study is a continuation of what you've done at the undergraduate level. Great. Thanks, Kara. Uh, Maureen, I'm sure you've reviewed a lot of applications over the years. <laughs> I, indeed, I have. I think my I think my biggest advice is to just tune into the directions carefully and follow them. Give them exactly what they've asked for. You don't need to give a lot of extra things, but if they want three letters of reference, be sure that you've got three letters of reference in. Um, if they want a resume, be sure you've got a resume and that you've proofread it carefully take advantage of career services and a good proofreader. Uh, same with your cover letter. So really it's your chance to put your best foot forward and particularly in a competitive program with a deep pool, those things matter that you're, that, that's your first impression, right? So make that a, make that a good one. You don't want typos or, or grammar errors and the like in your materials. Um, a good number of schools are starting to do away with standardized tests. 
But again, ask about that. Um, you can also ask if it uh, fits your situation. Some places will do uh, application fee waivers, uh, whether uh, sometimes for McNair scholars or high need students or whatever the case may be. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, I would also say, though, to be mindful of, of that, you know, and, and narrow your narrow, narrow your focus a bit um, rather than asking 20 schools for that. Really try to focus in on your on your top two or three places. If they do have uh, on site interviews as part of the process, I think if nothing else has happened since the pandemic started, we've figured out all sorts of things are possible to do uh, <laughs> virtually. Uh, you know, that that my uh, home academic programs and college student personnel and higher education administration, the fact that we're doing virtual interviews that we did it last year and we were doing it this year still sort of blows my mind a little bit because we've been so resistant to those things. Well, we're not anymore, right? And so I think some of those possibilities might might open out, up as well. But uh, really follow directions and be sure your materials are well proofread and well presented. Um, just a quick follow up question, Maureen. What advice would you give to applicants if perhaps they're reaching the application deadline and they feel like they need an extension. Is that something that they should request? Um, should they definitely meet that deadline? Is it firm? What would you say? I'd say it, it never hurts to ask and uh, it's to your advantage to be in that first group of candidates who is uh, reviewed. You know, so some have a hard deadline, some have more of a rolling deadline. But again, if it's a more competitive program uh, and they've got limited resources and limited spots, it's really to your advantage to be in that in that first group. Doesn't hurt to ask, but you you put yourself in a better position probably if you're able to to meet that deadline and, and be in that first group. And then one more follow up question from Ashley, one of our participants. If you can't visit a campus before committing to a program, um, how would you know that the campus or the university is a good fit for you? I would do some uh, good Google stalking, right? Uh, look at the look at the school newspaper, uh, even that the local paper. You know, how does the school get talked about? Um, looking, you know, looking at them on Twitter, you know, what are students saying, that sort of thing. But the other thing I would do is ask the program to connect you with a few current students yeah. that you might be able to visit with on, on Zoom or whatever um, and have a, be able to have some conversations with people um, and take what they say to heart and also know that everybody's experience and perspective is going to be a, a little bit differently. Um, if you have particular identities that are really salient to you around race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, whatever the case may be, you might also ask to talk with some students who share those same identities. You know. I talked to somebody the other day who would be coming with small children. Well, she might want to talk with other uh, student parents. So I, I think if you can be clear about what your needs are and what you're looking for, uh, they should be able to connect you with, with some students. Uh, and if they can't, that might be a bit of a, a yellow flag for you as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, let's continue with that, that idea of fit. Um, how did you know that Northern Arizona was a good fit for you? Um, so I, I, and, and I don't think I mentioned this, I, I'm working, I, I think it's implied, but I'm, I'm working uh, while I'm doing my graduate program. So I was looking for an online program um, first off. Um, I needed something that fit my goals. So, you know, I had a sort of in over years, I've compiled sort of what was important for me. And um, 
it was something that I could I could get into probably pretty easily. And um, I don't want to say that it's it's easy to you know get into you know a graduate program, but um, I, I knew that I didn't want to be taking the GREs, for example. So I was looking for um, something where I could bypass or a program where I could bypass that, a program where I could, um, you know, be flexible with my job and the in doing the program. So that meant that, unfortunately, I looked into some programs that were hybrid and did have some synchronous um, courses uh, available online, but even that was just not workable for me in my schedule. So. Um, after putting all those details together, I, I, I came up with NAU because it was a place where I, I wanted to be. And I also looked into um, the next step in the process. So for me, like I mentioned, I'm doing the I, I applied for the EDD program. That was important for me. I actually that was the end goal. So I wanted to go to a place where I could easily transition from one uh, the, the master's to the EDD program. And this was um, something that had, had all of that for me. Great. And Nadine, same question to, to you. How did you know that the School for International Training was a good fit for you? Sorry. Oh, uh, through my network, a lot of people just spoke to me about SIT. I was actually, I narrowed down my choices to Middlebury and SIT. Um, I went with SIT mostly because they were offering more scholarships and that's what it came down to. When I started the program, it was a hybrid model. So we were meant to do our summers in person and our semesters virtual. Um, due to COVID, we're, we're doing the rest of our um, program online, which is okay because it was set up to do so anyway. Um, but I also, as I was starting my program, I noticed a lot of people in USAC were alumni of SIT, and that kind of really grounded um, and solidified my feeling of I'm in the right school, I've made the right choice, and uh, yeah. Oh, one other thing for the for the um, a tip for actually application process. I, I didn't have to do an uh, interview for SIT's admissions, um, so I kind of realized that my essays were my interview. So um, when I went back to, when I was looking back at how I structured them, I did a past, present, and future format. So I asked, I addressed, what have I done in my past that has led me to this point of applying to grad school? I addressed what current issues, what's happening in the what's happening in the world that affect my that inform my decision to do grad school, and then finally, what will I do with the knowledge that SIT is going to give me in the future? Um, so, just structuring your essays or your personal statement in that way could be really helpful as well. That's really good advice, Nadine. Um, Kara, I know you've got um, something you want to say as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, one point if you went for students who are considering a degree abroad. Um, I think in, our focus has been more on uh, like general liberal arts studies, but for students who are interested in pursuing a medical field or education, something that legal law school, something that requires um, some higher level of credential certification or licensure in the United States. Um, really make sure that the school that you're considering um, would be one that would be recognized and um, approved for those licensure requirements in the United States as well. And so that should be part of your application process is to look um, at any re extra requirements that there might be for your career in the United States. And then the last thought, um, and this goes back to the question about how do you know a school is the right fit for you? I think one thing that's different about graduate school from undergraduate school is that the campus itself doesn't typically play as much of a role in the decision-making process. Keep in mind that this is a next level for intellectual pursuit, for getting a higher level credential or a degree. So really the emphasis is more on the classes that are there, the connections that you can make, the preparation that it provides you for your future career, um, and then the social aspects, the campus, et cetera, tend to be of, of less importance than they might be when you're an undergraduate and you're looking for that social environment. You know, that said, you still want to connect with like-minded individuals. And for me, and for my own graduate program, 
having, you know, my, my cohort was everything for me and it's what made the program work. So having a good cohort um, means something, but, you know, in terms of not being able to visit a campus beforehand, I think it's not quite as important, at least it wasn't for me in choosing a graduate program than it was for my undergraduate degree. Can I jump in as well and add something to that? Um, I agree with you 100%, Kara, because before I found SIT, I actually did a one semester, I got a graduate certificate um, from a school in DC. And I chose that program because I wanted to be at this amazing campus and have this wonderful university experience for my graduate school. And I realized in that first semester that that is not what graduate school was about and that's not what I wanted. I There weren't people who looked like me. It was a great university, has a great reputation, but I didn't connect with the cohort, with the campus, the location. And so I learned very quickly that grad school was more than just the looks, than just the name. Um, it's really about how you feel and the network that you'll be able to connect with. So um, yeah. That's why I ended up going with SIT. Yeah, that's a powerful message. Thanks, Kara, for drawing our attention to that, um, that point. Um, well, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll toss out one more question. Don't forget you can use the chat if you have additional questions, or you can use the raise the hand feature. Um, but we've kind of navigated through this process of decision making and application. So let's actually talk about the the uh, the actual experience in graduate school. So what sort of tips would you offer to folks about how to be successful once you're actually in a graduate program? Um, and we'll start with the, the two students who are actually in a graduate program. Um, so Caitlin, what would you say? Um, yeah, so a couple of tips here, I think, um, for how to be successful in a graduate program. Um, uh, Again, I think I already mentioned this, but make sure you're in the right program for yourself. You want to be there and, and you need to be there um, because that will make everything else easier. But um, it, it's a lot of work. And um, as a person who is you know, working full time while I'm doing graduate school, it's been really important for me to have a support system um, in place that you know includes my family, my friends, um, other individuals that you know, are are pushing me forward in this uh, this journey. You know, to to um, earn a, a master's degree or then an EDD program. So that's really important. Um, but another big thing is, and I'm sure everyone will can touch on this, is you know time management. Um, when when you're working full time and you're doing um, a program, it, it, whether it be online or in person, you know you need to be able to make some sacrifices and and, and say, okay, well. I, I can't do this thing that I used to do that was a lot of fun and, you know, make sure you're carving out the time for yourself. That's not to say that you should carve out time for like um, your mental health. That's very important. You know, if you're not, if you're, if you're mentally not there, then you're, you know, it, it, everything else will be really difficult too. So um, I just think it's really important that you stay honest with yourself with uh, the people around you. You know, if you're stressing out um, while you're in school, you know, be honest about that and, and start doing things to help you get out of that, you know, stressful mindset or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, my tips. Very good. Nadine, what would you add to that topic? Yeah, um, so along with uh, carving out time, I set specific times um, that are for school and especially being in an online format that's asynchronous, I, I have to have my 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And those are my times and that's when I do school and I stick to that and that's that's just what needs to happen um, for me to be successful. I would also say come up with a good system for um, saving all the resources that you really like, the, whether they're articles, whether they're professionals, experts in the field, you will be reading so much, it's like almost unfair. And it's it's all really, really, really good stuff. And sometimes over a year, you just forget like, oh, who said that? Or that was a really good recommendation for how to create a program. So 
just however, whether it's like a Google Doc or however you want to do it, um, have a system in place to save the resources um, that you really like. Um, I have like my work Bible, which is like a book over here that I just always have. Um, another thing that's really helpful is, especially in an online format, surround yourself with people who are in the field so you can have actual conversations and dialogue with those people about what's going on. So, you know, if, if you can't, if you're, if you're not in a classroom, you know, you need to be able to call your director or whoever and just say, hey, I need to talk about this issue currently happening in the field. That's super helpful. Um, and then my last tip is to just network. Go to conferences, volunteer at conferences, um, know who are the competitors in your field, um, explore the positions below you, explore the positions ahead of you, know um, everything that's going on around you in your field. That, 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 that's, that can really be helpful in um, making you successful. Nadine, I really like that tip about finding a, a method of organization that works well for you. It takes a little bit of time just because the, the workload and the experience is perhaps something you've never experienced before. So I just add on the tip of, you know, give yourself a little bit of time to figure out what's going to work best for you. Uh, you might need to try a few things first to discover what that looks like. I know from my own experience in my PhD program, it took me the first few weeks of my first semester to figure out where the ideal place for studying was, how to organize all the information that I was reading. So um, just be patient with yourself as well. Um, Kara, what would you say? I would say um, get to know your professors, build those connections, build those contacts, take advantage of um, lectures, discussion groups, anything that you can do to put yourself out there and build ties to people who are in the field and to people who have may, uh, may have other connections and can point you or introduce you to somebody when you get to the point of looking for jobs. I can't, uh, can't state that enough. And then the other thing for those of you who may be considering a PhD, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, you know, a PhD is a really significant commitment of time and the you need to be invested and truly interested in the subject matter. Um, I can speak for myself. One of the things that kept me from getting a PhD is that there were too many things that interested me, but no, no one single subject. And I just that dissertation, I just know myself well enough mm -hmm. that um, it took me two years to get through the master's thesis, and I just thought, no, I'm not ready to do that again. Um, but you know, it's, don't look at the PhD or even a master's degree as something that you feel you need to do just for the credential. Make sure you're doing it because you're genuinely interested and want to engage yourself in the subject matter. Um, Maureen, we'll end with you, and I'm going to present you with a question that has just um, popped up in the chat. Um, I'll read it here. Have you found that having a master's degree, especially in higher education, is what's more important versus the actual type of master's? Um, for example, if you received a, something in educational leadership or international education. Oh, I think you're muted right now, Maureen. Let's see here. Thank you. Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, I'm going to give the big uh, it depends answer yeah. <laughs> on that, you know, that it, it's it's truly just so dependent on the particular position, on the institution, on the the desires of the of the potential employer. Um, I've seen uh, there are plenty of people in educational leadership type roles from a variety of different backgrounds some of whom do it beautifully and some of some of whom I desperately wish had more of that educational uh, focus in, in what they're doing because there can really be a clash of philosophies, right? You know, so there's a degree to which higher education is a business and I understand that. And I want learning and engagement and things like that to be a significant driver in decisions and if we're only looking at the financial bottom line, you can you can miss a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So I think it I think it really depends. And Jeremy, I would guess that 
what you see in international ed, that you've got people with all sorts of backgrounds, some in educational administration, higher ed, student affairs, and some from international relations and all sorts of other things. Um, so I think it I think it depends. The other thing that I would add uh, in terms of sort of being successful in the program is really investing in the experience, being open to feedback and acting on that feedback. You've got to become a good writer to be successful in graduate school. So when you get feedback on your writing, you need to incorporate that. And if you need to take advantage of resources, a writing center, peer reviewers, that sort of thing, do that. Uh, it's it's no place for ego. And I think building, you know, others have spoken to this, the importance of building on those relationships. There's not a finite amount of success to be had. Graduate programs are better when everybody in them is better. So working together and, and collaborating to help each other learn and, and to get those uh, good experiences and good learning is is really what's what's critical. Um, and I think you're I think you're uh, right. The the comment about um, having work experience is really important as as well. And so some are getting that through assistantships and such. Some are doing it while working full time. And I think for doctoral programs with a strong practitioner focus many of them are going to want you to have post-master's experience as well because it it changes your view of the whole of the whole enterprise nadine it looks like you've got something to add yeah i just when i i wasn't sure um if i was going to do grad school or not and i start but i also know um i i like to be a leader I envisioned myself in leadership positions. And so when I started looking at people who were in those positions, everyone had a master's degree or a PhD, and especially in higher education. So um, I don't know one director or, and, or CEO at USAC, at the University of Nevada, at SIT, at other institutions in the United States and abroad um, who don't have master's or PhD. So um, if you want a leadership position in higher education, yeah. I am of the opinion that yes, you probably need to go get a master's degree at minimum. I agree fully on that one, Nadine. If, if you want to work in higher education, you, you need a minimal degree of a master's. Um, well, what an exciting discussion. I'm sure we could keep on going for another hour, but I want to respect everybody's time. So first of all, thank you to our panelists. I think your tips um, were very candid and very authentic. And, and based on my experiences, I think that's what's really been helpful to individuals who participate in these panels. So thank you so much for, for sharing your, your advice, your tips and your wisdom. Uh, of course, to everybody who joined us today, thank you so much. Um, we hope you you picked up a few tips and tricks along the way that you can apply um, into the future. Hopefully, you'll you'll follow through on your your goals to graduate school if you have them. Uh, also, I want to thank Dr. Alyssa Nata, who's the CEO and president of USAC. She's hanging out in the background, so thank you to Alyssa to attending today's uh, panel discussion. Um, if, if the panelists wish, um, this is up to you, but you can put your email address or um, the perhaps website of your graduate program or institution in the chat box, just in case any of our participants do wish to follow up with you. That's, that's totally up to you though. Um, you can feel free to do that if you wish. Um, but otherwise, if you'd like to learn more about um, USAC, you can head over to usac.edu to learn more about our study abroad programs. Um, and I want to wish everybody who attended today a very happy holiday season and all the best in the new year. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Jeremy, for hosting today. You're welcome. Thank you for everybody who came. Thank you.